Welcome to Act Online, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. The events of 9-11 are forever etched in the hearts of all Americans. Most of us still remember exactly where we were when it happened. In this episode, Acton's Director of Communications, Eric Cohn, sits down with Nils Jorgensen, a retired New York firefighter who shares his story of what happened at Ground Zero that day. As we approach the 20th anniversary of September 11th, let us reflect on the bravery and courage that took place those two decades ago, and to be especially thankful for all that God has given us. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Act in Line on our website at actin.org slash actinline. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. I'm joined today by Niels Jorgensen. Niels is the host of 20 for 20, a new podcast series from Iron Light Labs that tells 20 stories of heroism for the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You can listen and subscribe to 20 for 20 at 2420podcast.com, a link for which is included in the show notes of this episode. He was an FDNY firefighter for almost 22 years until a forced medical retirement because of leukemia he contracted from cleaning up Ground Zero. Niels also drove the truck in the Emmy-nominated Rescue Me with Dennis Leary. Niels Jorgensen, welcome to Act in Line. Well, sir, I appreciate it and thank you. Um, it's just it's an honor to be uh, to be interviewed and um, really appreciate your time. Before we get to some of the stories in this podcast series, I want our audience to hear your story. Where were you on 9-11? Sure. On um, the morning of 9-11, uh, I left my house, I guess, about 6.30. And uh, my little redheaded daughter at the time was about four and a half. And she said, Daddy, where are you going today? You're driving the fire truck, the oil truck, or the boar's head truck. Um, as uh, most of us in Responder world, we all have multiple jobs trying to make ends meet. Uh, so I, I, would, I smiled and laughed at her. I said, today, honey, I'm on the oil truck. She said, okay, you'll be safe then because she, she sort of understood the danger of the fire department. Um, both her granddads were also firemen. And, uh, so it was kind of a family, a family thing that we all understood. And, uh, I headed into work, uh, to deliver home heating oil. And, um, that was on the Northern end of Staten Island, uh, which actually on that beautiful Tuesday morning overlooks New York Harbor. Um, you could see the Statue of Liberty to the left, you see the Staten Island ferry crossing the Harbor into downtown. And, um, you see the, the towers in the skyline and, um, few minutes after the shift, uh, I, I was turning the truck out of the yard and I heard a frantic report on the news radio that the plane struck the tower. And I, uh, I turned around and looked across the harbor, saw the smoke and being jaded and cynical. I figured it was just uh, a Learjet pilot trying to get a closer look at the towers for a client and a uh, gust of wind might have took him into it. Um, in the city, we, we have 10,000 firefighters. Uh, 38,000 cops, 2,500 EMTs and medics. So we, we have a pretty huge uh, force. So they don't want uh, people running in off duty for incidents because it then becomes chaos as far as management and uh, chain of command. So I took it in. I thought about it. I said, oh, it's going to be at least a fifth alarm. It's going to be a bad day for those guys and those poor people in the plane. But knowing how well the, the towers were built, um, I was there in 93 for that bombing. Uh, I figured it would, wouldn't be so terrible. So I, uh, I proceeded on my day. Uh, I, you know, didn't check in at work because there was no reason to. And uh, a little while later, again, frantic report. Um, I finished loading up the truck in the yard. And, and now with that, I knew immediately it was terrorism. So I I ran the truck back into the yard, threw the keys to my boss and said, I have to go. And he understood. And I took off uh, toward Brooklyn uh, over to Verrazano Bridge. And um, normally that's bumper to bumper deal uh, in a rush hour. But uh, it was strangely enough, it was empty. So as I was flying over the bridge and um, my father, who retired 34 years from the department, we'd always talk about the recall, which basically is a mandatory uh 
mandatory recall of all emergency personnel in the city when there's a serious, serious situation and you're you're supposed to go to your your command where you where you work and get your gear and get orders and basically wait to be deployed or or stand at the ready for possible you know second wave or something coming. So as I was going over, I got off the bridge and I was heading on Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And my wife called me and she said, "Where are you?" And I said, "I'm I'm heading in." And she said, "No, no, you're not. Those those she'll never curse normally, but she said those effing buildings will come down and you'll be dead. Go to your firehouse where you're supposed to go." And I thought about it for a quick second and I said, "Well, she's right. I mean, I have no gear. Uh, I'll be of no use if I get there because you have no fire gear. You can't run into a burning building." So I, I veered off the highway uh, up the street to ladder company 114 which was uh my my assigned uh company during that period of time in my career uh i spent eight years there and it's just the best years of my life best people i've ever encountered uh got into the firehouse and the computer was uh, had dispatched the truck and they were gone uh the on-duty shift was gone uh under the command of lieutenant dennis oberg and they were responding to the trade center so I checked in with my command and the, the chief of the 40th Battalion said once there's 12, 12 firefighters uh, mustered up, get the, get your gear, get a city bus and get down to the Brooklyn Bridge because the battery tunnel, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel at the time, there was rumors that they were going to uh, set off a device in the tunnel, try to kill people responding. So we got to 12. Uh, we signed in. One lieutenant came in. He took command. And... Um, just as we were leaving to commandeer the bus, we saw the tower go down. We had the TV on, uh, the department radio was in the background. And a few minutes prior to that, I heard Dennis, our lieutenant, say, um, about a company 114 with 1084 uh, on the Manhattan dispatch frequency, which meant we were in the borough. Uh, they had gone from Brooklyn uh, through the tunnel to the towers. And uh, they said, um, okay, 114, you're going to be assigned to the command post Albany or West. And uh, 114's nickname is Tally Ho. And the boss said, uh, Tally Ho 10 4. And that meant, okay, they had their assignment. Now they knew where they were going. Uh, when that building went down, I was, I was in my mind thinking, oh my God, they're in it and they're gone. Uh, and I realized that at the time there was many, many firefighters uh, assigned on that fifth alarm. And it was, I think, immediately raised to a tenth alarm by the first chief. Second, second or third chief in on the scene. So we commandeered the bus. We headed down to two other firehouses to pick up other uh, people that were coming in for the recall. And uh, we stopped at my my dear best friend, my childhood best friend, John Sharp, his uh, company, Engine 201. And he was on duty. And those guys also raced to the fire. And um, they, were, they were killed, uh, except for one gentleman that was ordered to go further away from the building to try to obtain water. And that's what saved his life. And then we proceeded down engine 239. We grabbed those guys. And uh, and then we got onto the path of the Brooklyn Bridge. Things things got quite backed up with traffic. Uh, people were fleeing. There was people walking across the bridge in droves. So it was kind of a difficult uh, drive, you know, meandering through that. And um, as we got to the bridge, the other, the other town went down. And I, at that point in time, I just said, oh, my God, we, we've just lost about 500 of our people. And um, I guess I wasn't too far off that number because we ended up losing 343 firefighters, 23 Port Authority police, 17 NYPD police, and another dozen uh, paramedics, EMTs, a couple of federal agents, and a couple of New York State court officers. And we got uh, let off the bus the driver was so brave to come in with us. He wouldn't give us the bus. He said, I'm sorry, I have to take you. I will not give it up. And uh, I never got his name. I wish I could have thanked him. Like we did thank him then, but I uh, wish I could thank him now because really it was, he went above and beyond. Uh, he, he drove into a war zone and turned around and drove back out. And then we just, uh, we basically, we were deployed. Uh, now it was command. We're starting to set up second, third, fourth, fifth waves of, personnel because now the both towers are down uh shortly thereafter number seven came down and uh it was it was a chaotic um really a chaotic chaotic day um i have to say though it was it was fairly well managed for the chaos that was ensuing um 
you know, command, we're doing their best. It's just something we've never really been hit with that large, that large of a scale of an incident. Mm-hmm. Um, and how long, how long were you there that day? We stayed on, um, my particular platoon, um, we were there till probably about four thirty in the morning. And what ended up happening is we were medically destroyed. Uh, we couldn't breathe. We, our eyes were covered over with, with just dust and glass. And, uh, it got to a point where we were physically not helping much. So my Lieutenant decided that we would go back, uh, you know, get ourselves back, you know, together, get some medical aid if we needed it, hopefully just, just clean our eyes out properly. Uh, our throats were caked with, with stuff. It felt like you swallowed a box of razor blades. And, um, the strange, the strange part about that ride back is they, they drove us through the battery tunnel in a bus. And that was earlier that day. Um, Stephen Siller, a very brave young fireman who was off duty himself. And he, uh, got his gear, got to that tunnel and he couldn't proceed with his pickup truck. So he, he parked in and he ran through with his 60 pounds of gear. And, um, he had five children, and he was off duty. He didn't have to go in. He did. And he died. And the, the beautiful fund, the foundation called the Tunnel of the Towers, was established in his name by his brother Frank and his family. And um, that's part of our mission is to, is to support them because they've, they've gone on now for the last 20 years to, uh, to rescue rescuers, to basically be the protectors of those who protect. And they build a home for every uh, every every soldier, every military personnel, every first responder in the United States that is unfortunately killed in the line of duty or seriously injured, uh, they will build them a home and they will take away that um, that stress and that burden on that surviving family. So so earlier that day, Stephen had actually gone through that tunnel and I had no idea he did. And we got back and uh, as we walked up the hill to the firehouse because the bus couldn't proceed up, um, one of the older guys said, you know, we're, we're all dead. And I said, no, we, we made it. And he goes, no, you don't understand. He said, you see how you feel right now? And I, 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 I really, I couldn't even breathe. I mean, it was, it was, it was really bad. And uh, he said, no, we're dead. He said, you feel what you're breathing now? He said, it's all poison. He goes, we're all going to die from this. And, you know, I, I first I thought, nah, he's wrong. But now, you know, all these years later, uh, he's, he's right. I mean, there's, there's now, um, it's just about to surpass the number of souls taken that day. Um, we have lost to 9-11 illnesses, uh, multiple cancers, resp- respiratory disorders. And now, um, which is really, really starting to be a big, big problem, are autoimmune diseases, which are not actually recognized and covered uh, by the federal legislation that now protects us. Um, we had some wonderful, wonderful people who spent years of their life fighting, literally fighting for our protection. Uh, gentleman, John Field from the Field Good Foundation, who, along with the late firefighter, Ray Pfeiffer, who was just a beautiful soul, who lost his entire firehouse that day. Uh, engine 40, ladder 35, when entire platoon was killed. And Ray Ray went on a mission to to help get them, to help get everyone medical coverage. And the sad part about it is he fought multiple cancers for nine years, uh, and uh, he, he, he fought literally uh, terminal cancer for, for nine years and was in a wheelchair in Washington with John Feel, um, with Detective Alvarez, Luis Alvarez, and, um, and later on, um, the actor John Stewart, who, mm-hmm. who took up the cause to, to protect us and help us. And it was shameful because I was down there a, few, a couple few times with them and politicians were literally running away. Um, hiding in closets and meeting rooms to avoid John Feel and his army. Uh, that's what we called it, the army, because he was on a mission. And it took years of literally shaming these people to do what was right and pay the medical bills. There was guys in the process of dying that were still saddled with three hundred, four hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars in medical bills, and no one would pay them. Um, I ended up uh, in 2011. I uh, I contracted a very rare form of leukemia Um, that was very well advanced. And um, I had complained for a couple of years, something was wrong. And and I was somewhat just being brushed off because we were all beat up from it. And, um, you know, if you went and sought counseling for stress for, you know, losing your friends, you were sort of labeled 
they put a little bit of a, you know, sort of a, a, a scarlet letter on your, your medical folder. And uh, so everything then was chalked off to, oh, it's psychosomatic or, you know, all you guys, all you guys did was drink after that. You guys all have PTSD. And, you know, I have to say that, unfortunately, that is right. There, there are a lot of guys that are suffering right now, really suffering badly. Um, and no fault of their own, Mm -hmm. you know, they were, they were in a war zone and now worse than that, they're, they're retired and they're fighting these illnesses and they're suffering in silence because, you know, when you're in a firehouse, you have the kitchen, you have the guys, you have the, the, that second family that unfortunately sometimes becomes closer than your, your real family because of the things you share together. And now that's taken away. And as Ray Pfeiffer had said, they forced him to retire. And he was, he was sick. He was dying. And they knew it. They could have just let him stay until he passed with the pride and the dignity of still being on the job. And I was forced to retire in 2012. And I'm not going to lie. There's days I still feel the effects of the chemo I, I received, but there's days I know I can still do the job. Mm-hmm. And I was given no chance. They just put me out. They didn't want to hear it. Your liability, um, what it comes down to is they can hire two or three new guys for the price of one old guy and they, they farm you out to pasture and you're, you're done and it crushes your soul because military police fire were trained in and medics trained in just about everything except for one thing. And that's how to retire. And that is just the, the toughest one to navigate because you're just lost. You're, you're literally one day, a member of this great organization. And the next day you're out there in the middle of January, like I was walking my, my rescued Greyhound and just looking down at her going, what are we going to do now? Yeah. She said, well, she looked at me and said, we're going to take some more walks. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, it was, that was my respite, my, my, my Greyhound to since past, but, uh, yeah, but I've, I've been blessed, Eric. I, I, uh, I, my leukemia is, is the rarest one. And the strange thing is that there was uh, seven, there's only four, 500 cases of it in all of North America a year. And I was the seventh rescuer in six month period in 2011 to come down with it. And my oncologist, who is just the greatest guy in the world, uh, Dr. Peter Menzel, he's just this big, huge guy from Poland. He's, he's a devout Catholic guy and, and I am a devout Catholic. So we get along really, really great. And I love the man. He's just, uh, he's more like an older brother to me now than, than my doctor. But he said it's impossible for that many people to come down in such a small segment of a population with that concentration, you know, uh, of that many folks coming down with this same cancer. And by the grace of God, um, he, you know, he, he years ago, was involved, you know, many, many years ago, some of his fellow doctors and scientists had developed this, this drug that they treated me with. Um, I received, you know, almost two and a half years worth of chemo treatments compressed into seven days and, uh, they burned out my bone marrow or basically I was going to die. Um, at the time now, since then there's, there's a couple new drugs they've developed that are less caustic and less near lethal. Um, but at the time I was praying to die. It was so vicious. Uh, I, I really just said, I'm done. I'm, I'm good now, you know, let me go. And, uh, I actually had a vision of my, my beautiful Irish mother-in-law who was just the sweetest woman in the world, went to church every day and I had a quick vision of, of just all the people I lost in my life who I loved. And it was very, very fast. It was just like, but then she appeared for like 30 seconds and she's just smiling. And she used to call me a boyfriend. Uh, as you can tell, I, I like to talk. I'm Irish and Scandinavian and we, we, we can go, Yeah, we can go on, we can go on like a virus. Uh, but yeah, my mother-in-law and I used to talk for hours and she, and she smiled and she said, no, she had passed away six months before I was sick and uh, she suffered. She was in a coma for six months and on life support and it wasn't fair. And she just, uh, she looked at me and she smiled. She said, no, my boyfriend, he, I, I said, Nan, I want to go. Nan, please take me. I'm ready. She said, no, no, he's not ready yet. You have to go back. You have to, some things to do. And I'm like, no, Nan, I hurt so much. Please, I just, just want to go home. She's, she smiled. She laughed. She said, nope, not yet. She just faded away. And I was grabbing at her and crying. And uh, strange enough, I had the one doctor at the time who, who was, somewhat of an atheist, I guess. And I don't, I don't want to rip her. She was a good doctor, but she didn't have faith. 
And, and I, she asked me, you know, they told me what my, my nurse, uh, just, just to veer back for a second, my nurse who was an incredible human being, Mike Nunez, he was my lifeline. And um, just a few other nurses that were so wonderful. This one young lady, Alta Gracia. But Mike, Mike was kind of my main guy. And uh, he put up with a lot with me because the, the drugs, the chemo made me very combative. It, it burns out your, your, your mind and your body at the same time. It's, it's, that's what it does. It kills just about everything in its path, but it kills the cancer. And uh, I was expressing to everyone that, you know, I saw my mother-in-law and this doctor, she was, she wasn't having it. She thought I was really off the reservation at that point and I lost my mind. And it was like, you know, uh, you know, this shrink came in. He was a Orthodox Jewish man and uh, he's smiling. He's, I said, hi, hi doc, I've never seen you before. Who are you? You know, cause I had this team of doctors and he said, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm the uh, psychiatrist. And I said, Oh, okay. I guess I really did lose my mind. So he, he asked me to tell him about what, what was happening, the vision. And, and he, he started to laugh and he said, oh, you're OK. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, no, I believe you. He said, um, I've, I've heard I've had other patients express the same thing. You were close to that other side and you saw what you saw. And he said, you're fine. And he said that doctor, her faith is different than ours. He said, you and I share a belief. And uh, he said, I, I fully believe what you said. And he said, so what else do you want to do? I said, well, what do you mean, doc? He said, well, they pay me for an hour. We only took 20 minutes. So we, we sat and watched the Yankee game for 45 minutes and, uh, you know, hung out and talked. Uh, so it was, it was a strange, um, strange long chain of events, I guess. But, the, you know, the sad part about it is starting in about 03, um, guys started getting sick and dying. But initially, initially we didn't, um, we didn't think it was the trade center for some strange reason, you know, because guys in the fire department, especially, they, they do die of cancer, right? It's it's fairly fairly common, unfortunately, because of the toxins we're constantly taking in. But then all of a sudden, it just started to be beyond coincidence. Young, young, really young men. Um, this one young gentleman, John McNamara, was one of the first. I think John was about 35, and he had advanced colon cancer. And, and you know, he fought a really hard fight and looked like he was doing okay. And then all of a sudden, he came back, and he... He just had a brand new baby and he was gone. And that's when I realized, and I think John was sorry for forgetting exactly when, but I think it was in 2005. And then I started thinking, oh boy, this is, this is starting to become a problem. So it was so sad because now guys were starting to really get sick. And then, and then the games began, the, the denial. Yeah. The, it, oh, this isn't from 9-11. This isn't, this isn't possible. I, I want to turn our attention to what, what you say in the intro to your podcast series that this is the danger of fading from our collective memory. And I was a sophomore in college when 9-11 happened. And, you know, my, my dad and my brothers are from New York. The first time I've ever visited New York City was in 1996 yeah. and did the math on it and figured out that the, the day we flew in to New York was September 11th. 1996. And we wow. stayed at what the time was the newly renovated Marriott Hotel at the World Trade Center. The yes. next day went up to the top of the building. Um, so I have this, you know, very formative memory of the first time that I went to New York, which was this place that I just revered as a kid because I knew that's where my dad was from. Yes. Um, having that experience and seeing the towers and then just being so obviously like so many of us were who didn't have your experience, but we're watching it through a television, um, just struck. And you know, you know, like you, you know that everyone can give that answer. It's that single unifying moment where you know where you were when it happened. And as you point out in the intro to your podcast that, you know, now college freshmen weren't alive when this happened. And I'm going through these news stories where you see, you know, that there people have – students now say they have zero knowledge of 9-11. They didn't actually know about it. They don't understand what's going on. How, how could something so impactful seem to fade so quickly only 20 years later from our collective memory? Is it just something that we feel compelled to block out or do you think there's something else going on there? This is just my personal opinion and, you know, I hope I don't uh... – getting hate mail out of it but it's it's because it's such a controversial subject uh event you know uh it was an attack it was it was a fanatically engineered attack of hate upon 
what America is. It was an attack on freedom, on religious freedom, on life choice freedom, on just just the the essence of what America is. My mom is an immigrant. She's from Ireland and she came here at 16 years old. And I love my Irish family. I have a lot of them. And they'll be upset for me to say this. I lived there for a year when I was a teenager. I love it. It's a beautiful place. It's beautiful people, but it's not America. And I could not wait to be back here. And I think what it is, is 9-11 was an attack on what we are about. It was to cut through our fabric and destroy it by fanatic fundamentalists. You can call them whoever they are, whatever group it was. You know, um, and I think there's people that want to sort of sugarcoat that and dust it down and just make it less uh, controversial. You you can't find footage, Eric, of those folks who jumped from their deaths. When they showed that footage that first day of those poor folks in their desperate moment of rather than burn to death, 80, 90, 100 floors up. They chose to leap, and some of them had umbrellas and garbage bags and their, their, their jacket or something that they tried to use as a semi-parachute to, to lessen their fall. And they plummeted to earth at 125 miles an hour. And the first firefighter killed, Daniel Sir, was actually struck by a human being who was jumping for their life. And Daniel, in his mission to run in to save those people he was killed by one of those desperate victims so it's so sad that they want to erase that that's the horror sometimes history is not it's not touchy feely there's some bad things about history in in all generations right since we've been formed i mean the country was formed unfortunately on bloodshed but if you don't show the images and you don't pass on the stories what happens is the knowledge is not retained. Um, I was just on a flight recently. Uh, I live in Tennessee now. I, I moved to the tree, to the middle of nowhere, which I call it. I don't mean that insultingly to heal my fractured soul. Uh, I like, I like the country. It reminds me of Ireland. When I was a young boy, I'd go to my grandma's farm every summer. And I just, when I flash back on my life file, it was the happiest moments of my life right up alongside of, you know, getting married, having my beautiful children and getting on, swearing into the United States Army, the New York City Police Department, and then the New York City Fire Department after that. Just the highlights of my life. But living in the country is, is just, it's so healing for the soul. But on a flight recently back down here, this young lady sitting next to us, she was 12 and she saw this hat that I'm wearing. This is my proud former ladder company, 114, Tally Ho. And she was a, a smart young lady and she, she was flying home with her mom and dad or family. And she said, sir, um, is that a fireman hat? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, are you a fireman? I said, well, I was. And she said, well, why, why not? How come no more? And I said, well, I said, I'm sick. I, I got cancer and I had to retire. Um, she said, well, well, why are you sick? I said, well, I was at 9-11 and um, there was very toxic compounds that we breathed in. And she said, what was 9-11? Was that something with a plane and someone crashed into a building? And, and I said, yeah. I said, there, there was some bad people that day who flew a bunch of planes into a few buildings and another one into a was, was stopped from flying into a building by a bunch of brave people in Pennsylvania. And the sad thing is, Eric, she had no knowledge of it. And she was a very, very intelligent young lady. And I faulted that on the education system. There's people amongst it that just want to pretend this never happened. Well, it happened. And we're, we're not on any political mission with this project. We just want the stories to be told. There were some really great people that day, responders, civilians, clergy, uh, people who were cooks in the restaurant on the windows, you know, windows in the world restaurant, 107 stories up. Uh, people from all backgrounds. I don't remember how many countries they said the victims of 9-11 were from, but it's a massive amount of countries because especially in New York City. I mean, New York City is, is just a cross-section of the world, right? Um, and 
yet they don't want to tell that. They don't want to tell that that whole melting pot died together. Yeah, I want you to tell us about Al Bracca, the, yeah. um, because you talked to David Bracca, who's his yes. uh, son for one of the episodes. Tell, tell us about his dad, Al. Yeah, this beautiful man, Al, they called the Rev. And Al, Al had a very, very strong faith, and which was galvanized when his, his four-year-old daughter was diagnosed with a fatal blood disease. And him and his wife sought, sought religious counsel, I guess. And this priest, uh, this, this reverend who prayed with them so, so hard and just continuous. And miraculously, this little girl was cured. And Al then just devoted his life, even though he was a bond trader, a bond broker in, in Cantor, he, he was also a very religious man who was active in his church. And he would get mocked for it, um, you know, in a joking way. You know, it's, it's like the firehouse kitchen is a real tough place at times. There's a lot of chop breaking going on. And, and similar with traders and brokers, right? They, they're, they're, you know, it's a jocular world and it's, it's, and, you know, Al would partake in any of the carousing, you know, drinking, or sometimes they would go to, you know, strip bars or whatever. So they would call him the Rev and they would tease him. Well, in 1993, when they were being evacuated, he was praying the whole way down with everyone holding hands and they got out and they were saying, hey, hey, Al, you got us, right? You're praying. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, unfortunately, 9-11, they couldn't evacuate. So what he did is he gathered his his office personnel, his people, his colleagues, dozens of them, and they gathered around and he, he, he basically got up on the desk and he was, was praying, uh, leading a prayer just saying, we're, we're going to go see God now. This is We don't have a chance, but we have a chance to go see him in heaven. So let's get there. And I mean, you want to talk about courage. Wow. I mean, I don't know if I could have done that, if I could have kept it together like that and said, hey, all right, this is it. And, and the way his son David tells the story is just so beautiful because his faith was so powerful. And the one thing is, there, there may have been people there that day with no faith, and, you know, we're not on, um, this isn't a preaching mission, what we're on. This is just a storytelling mission. But faith seems to come in and out of it repeatedly. It's one of the predominant themes that we've been coming across with these people, with these folks, these kind folks who've spoken to us. And these people just basically huddled together until the moment that building came down. And the beautiful story is that Al was up, I think it was almost a hundred floors up and they found his body intact and they were able to identify it. And that's almost a miracle in itself because unfortunately half the souls that died that day, I think it's, you know, 200, 2,977, half of them have never even been identified because the, the forces involved in that collapse were so huge. The physics involved them. I'm, I'm not that great with math and science, but, but I can, just had seen from being there, wow, there were some powerful forces. Things were pulverized into dust and bodies were pulverized into just unidentifiable remains. And here's Al, he was, he was, he literally rode, it seemed like he rode the top of the collapse down as if God just symbolically said, they're okay. He helped lead them to me. And now your family can take you back. And it, when, you know, sitting there with David, it, I had to try to keep my composure because you don't want to upset the folks you're interviewing. But some of these interviews I've left and I've been emotionally drained. I mean, to the point of the emotions I thought that came getting home from 9-11 a few days later, four days later, and uh, the emotions of finding out I was in a fight for my life. And, And then for me, the worst, the stupidest thing when I think about it is I was the most upset when I lost my job. As crazy as that sounds, but doing these interviews is so emotionally draining because these people are kind enough to bear their soul and you feel their pain. And the sad part about it is it's been for, not to say totally forgotten because there's some really, really good people out there, but it's been forgotten by a huge segment of the population and it hurts them so much. And one of the repeated things I hear from these folks is, they they saw the feelings. Uh, they saw the scenes on nine twelve on the day after the towers came down and all the destruction happened. We still had hopes that there were people alive in the pile, and um, 
Unfortunately, those hopes faded away after about four days when we realized that this is now a recovery mission. This isn't a rescue mission. But people were lined up for a mile up the West Side Highway with American flags and signs of encouragement for police, for medics, and for firefighters, and for the nurses who came down to, to help and set up the triage stations. And the unity was incredible. It didn't matter what color, what creed, what gender, what this, what that. It was just everyone was American and everyone was hugging and crying and smiling. And, and sad enough, people were smiling because they were so proud and, and they, were, they were cheering us on for going in. And Eric, I never felt such, such a blanket of, of unity. It was, it was such a great feeling, as strange as that might sound during such a tragic time. And I feel like it's gone. I feel like there's people out there that want us to be divided. They're just, they're just wringing their hands going, all right, all right, we got them. We got them now. Everyone's pissed off. Everyone's angry. If you look around, you know, the chance that someone's not wearing a mask, they're not smiling. Where did that go? What happened? Like, how could we be such an ungrateful, thankless, angry society? We're in America. This is the greatest country in the world. It's not perfect. It's got its blemishes, you know, but but damn, it's the best place on, on earth. There's people still flooding in here, right? I mean, no one's flooding out. I don't see anyone racing out to go to China or Russia. No, no offense against those guys, but they're racing to come here. You know, my grandpa Nels, he was from Denmark. He was a complicated soul. He, he, left, he left home at 12 years old to be an apprentice baker. And um, I think it tormented him for the rest of his life because he wasn't treated well by people who were in his family. And then he joined the Danish Navy, 17, and he was here in his early 20s and one of those American success stories, you know, 25 bucks in his pocket, sponsor family from his hometown in Denmark that were here. He landed in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and he hit the ground running. He mastered the language. He sat on the front steps of the apartment building and he listened to every word being spoken. And he had the sponsor family interpret it for him. And he mastered English within six months. And I remember with his Danish accent, walking through Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, holding his hand. And he, he didn't believe in, in checks. He believed in paying everybody in cash. He didn't trust the banks. <laughs> and he, didn't, he, he wasn't a very trusting guy. Uh, and we'd walk around and pay the electric bill and pay the phone bill and pay the gas bill and, and pay the plumber and pay this guy and that guy. And my grandfather ended up owning a small apartment building. He worked his tail off. He worked really hard. And he would tear up when we saw the American flag or if he heard, you know, the Star Spangled Banner or if it was Memorial Day or, or you know, one of the parades. Uh, Fourth of July, we'd go down by the waterfront to watch the fireworks. And he'd have tears streaming down his cheeks. And he had these big old cheeks. And I said, Grampy, how come, Gramps, how come you're sad? Why are you crying? He says, I'm not sad, Nils. I'm not sad. I'm, I'm filled with joy. I'm in America, and I love this country. And, you know, his, his hometown was overrun by the Nazis during World War II. And, and they took over, them, you know, took over Denmark and that whole area of Northern Europe. And he was devastated. He was just so devastated. But he was so thankful that American troops, he was too old. He went down to try to fight, and they, they wouldn't take him. And he was so thankful that American troops fought back the Nazis and, and basically prevented the world from being taken over. And now just, you, you just get these watered down versions of history. Things are, are just manipulated and taken out of it. It's kind of like they just want to, you know, pick cherry pick what's, what can go out and what can't. And that's sad because now people aren't getting what really happened. Well, you know, we, we do, a pretty good job of telling the incredible stories about World War II. Um, of course, you have a things that happened over a longer period, but as you're telling here, these are all stories that some of them happened on that day, but some of them are also about what happened in the aftermath. And I hope that this project is really leads the way in telling those stories so that we don't have this fade from our collective memory. The story of Al Bracca, who you just told, is only one of uh, one of 20 stories that you are telling in this series, uh, 20 for 20, 20 stories about heroic stories about the 20 years since 9-11. Um, Niels, thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you for this project and for everything you did that day and in the years after. 
Eric, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time. And we just hope that people, if they're kind enough, uh, they can log on to 2420podcast.com, uh, 20FOR20podcast.com. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to lend our support to 9-11 charities. We're going to try our best to make the, get the awareness out there and, and get folks to donate and, and anything left after we put this together, all of, uh, all of it's going to go, go to these charities to help out. And, uh, we really thank you folks for, for, for listening and Eric, thank you and God bless you, sir. And thanks for what you're doing. That website again is 2420podcast.com to listen and subscribe. And we'll put a link to that website in the show notes for this episode. Niels Jorgensen is the host of 20 for 20, a new podcast series from Iron Light Labs that tells 20 stories of heroism for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Niels, thank you so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Thank you, sir. And God bless you. And God bless America. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Actonline, I'm Gabriel Zsazsa.